Should virtual care training be part of every residency and medical school curriculum? Let's find out. Hi, this is Junaid, neurocritical care stroke and epilepsy specialist, and today we're going to talk about our last section of virtual care and why is it important for the future. One of the things that I've been trying to tell you is that the virtual care is like a gateway drug for digital health and digital health transformation in healthcare. So virtual care is basically the first step, not the end all or the be all. And virtual care delivery is one of the options. Maintaining that, but the main question is that since it is going to be one of the major portions of care delivery, especially in chronic care management, should this be taught on a consistent, conformative, standardized way to all physicians, including in their residencies, fellowships, even at the level of medical school or not. And that is what we're going to tackle today. Especially that is important to you, given that now it is the season for residency applications and you're going to be interviewing at places as well. You want to evaluate clearly that do they have an official curriculum to teach you virtual care delivery as one of the options for your future is extremely important. So let's talk about that. Now, if you look at it, unfortunately, there is clearly a significant amount of lack in training because there is a difference in which people are going to be able to interact with patients and they have to know, know and they have to know something different. They need to know different rules, regulations, etc. And they unfortunately do change. So let me give you an example. When the COVID hit, the pandemic hit, basically there was an you know, emergency. And during that emergency, the HIPAA rules and regulations were actually suspended for some time. And you could use your FaceTime or even your, I don't know, WhatsApp video to actually provide care. But of course, these things are going to come back and you really need to know what the HIPAA requirements are. And therefore, you're implementing it, your virtual care delivery in a legal fashion. And it's just not the HIPAA. I mean, to be honest with you, HIPAA is one just small portion of things. How do you consent patient to see the patient in terms of uh, virtual care delivery is concerned? So even let's say as I was working as an, you know, vice president of clinical strategy at a telemedicine service, I had to teach my providers that, hey, in these systems, virtual care strategy or virtual care health delivery is not considered standard of care. So whenever you are doing that, you have to take consent from the patient individually to make sure that you can provide virtual care to that patient as it is not considered standard of care. In other places, they have actually written in their legal procedure that this is the standard of care. So therefore, any person who's walking in that means they're already consented to provide care so those are the differences that you need to know in terms of how to provide care in a legal ethical fashion I always take consent either way but the best way is to actually make sure at least what the regulation is period and we are looking at very different ways of doing things as a matter of fact during the pandemic the complete medical students were unfortunately removed from the you know rotations and everything and this is the fantastic article that you should read how to virtually become a doctor in new york times so clearly there is definitely a reason to become a proficient in virtual care delivery because as i've told you this is going to be one of the major areas of care delivery options depending on subspecialty of your choice and if it is something important you should definitely consider that and if you do a literature review you're going to see that there are multiple places that are actually indicated that how their experience was when they were developing their new curriculum. To be honest, most people were working on developing a curriculum for virtual care delivery. Now, just to give you an example, like I was in St. Louis doing my stroke residency. And during that time, uh, St. Louis University Hospital was the largest telehealth network of stroke with 34 satellite sites. We were providing it over the phone, but that important thing is always there to actually be able to provide care from you know patient to patient from physician to patient or physician expert to physician ER or physician primary care physician so those are the things that we have been doing it is just more formalized it is more advanced with video capabilities now so we are seeing that some of these places like Cleveland Clinic have already adopted some curriculum and their curriculum was actually more standardized. This helps us to understand what the regulation, requirements, ethical aspects, etc. are important in terms of understanding virtual care delivery at its breadth. And therefore, you can expand on it because when you know the basis right, when you know the gateway drug right, then you can expand on that, you know, knowledge base and be able to digitally enable care for your patients in the future. One of the things that truly excites me about virtual care is basically care planning. 
The benefit of doing care planning specifically virtually with the help of remote clinical staff, with the help of, you know, virtual uh, clinical staff, you can amazingly improve both the expectation, the experience of the patient, while understanding what are the true barriers in terms of advancing care to that particular patient and doing that virtually is extremely important and i think this is one of the papers that you should read separately the link will be in the blog post and below in the description that we need to train residents in virtual care planning and it is quite feasible to do so because one of the things that we need to understand especially when you are joining towards a primary care service like pediatrics internal medicine family medicine what you do in advanced care planning not only that it is going to bring you a significant amount of revenue in the clinic because that's a separate cms code for the future but more importantly Physicians like neurologists and cardiologists, they are doing principal care management and you're doing chronic care management and both of you can both benefit from better patient care, better outcome, digitally enabled care and increased revenue in terms of providing care to those patients. And as you know, how to set up a workplace for telemedicine is extremely important because again, you're basically working from home and you are not, even not from home per se, you're in a particular station that needs to be set up that you can provide better. So make sure you review that video. I give you recommendations on camera, how to position your camera, how to maintain eye contact, how to get consent, etc, etc. So make sure you review that video when you are making your own telemedicine workspace. Also, we published recently an article called Implementation of Virtual Care in Neurology, Challenges and Pitfalls. You really need to review this article if you're actually specifically interested in neurology because as I said, neurology patient population is different. They have dementia, they're older patients, etc. So designing a process for neurology virtual care is slightly different than doing your regular pediatrics or internal medicine or family medicine because of the patient population, because of the disease aspect that can impact your cognition, walking, etc. So not only it is extremely important for patient access, patient equity, but it is also very important to have that process in a design way that you are providing continuity of care. As I told you before, neurology is extremely important because you can get more information because if the, for example, epilepsy patient has agoraphobia, they really are sometimes scared to get out of their own house. If you are able to provide that care at their own house, first of all, they will get care. And then second of all, you can slowly help them better and better, get the psychiatrist online with you at the same time, or actually refer to them, psychologists, etc. So it opens up a whole slew of opportunities that we didn't have before. And this is extremely important for the patients. So make sure you review that paper as well. Link in the description. If you want me to review the whole paper on video, let me know in comments and I'll be happy to do that for you. One of the last aspects I really wanted to share with you was basically the environmental impact. I actually will link the video again, which I did approximately two, three days ago. And as you can see, this, this video actually got quite a bit of attention. And what I wanted to know is tell you that how during this residency season, you we can save a massive environmental impact by doing virtual residency interviews. Just look at the international medical graduates. I mean, there are approximately 12,000 of them and approximately 8,000 of them are international medical graduates. If they're gonna travel from around the world just to give interviews, that's a massive amount of greenhouse gases, travel costs that can be avoided by doing virtual care interviews. But that brings us to another problem, right? Like how can you really choose a residency place where you're gonna be trained for the next three to four years in true conceptualization is how better that program is for you. So I think I would give an appeal to the residency program directors and, and residency programs around the US to actually create a virtual sort of tour of their residency programs so that the applicants can actually see what are the benefits and the limitations of your program. Everyone, everything has pros and cons and you should be open to it because you really want to find the right resident too. So you should actually basically create a full virtual care, a virtual tour of your residency program and post it on your websites. Make sure that the websites are completely updated. And for the residents, I would appeal and make sure that you review the website before the interview. And by the way, if you haven't looked at my interview videos, I'll link the post down below, how to prepare for a residency interview and how to prepare for virtual interviews, how to set up your camera, how to set up everything. So I just wanted to make sure that you understand that this interview season is extremely important. I just wanted to make sure that you understand that when you're evaluating your residency program choice you need to see if they are have a virtual care curriculum and more importantly of course train yourself for a better interview process especially virtually thank you so much for your time